Hello and welcome to chapter three of business analytics on the topic of summary measures. The key learning objectives of this chapter are to calculate and interpret measures of location, also to calculate and interpret measures of dispersion, shape and association, and to get familiar with box plots and z-scores to identify outliers in data. First, the measures of location. The term central location refers to how numerical data tends to cluster around some middle or central value. At times, when we're looking at a range of information, we do need to find the overall mean, median, or mode. Measures of central location attempt to find a typical or central value that describes a variable. When you're looking at the variations of different number sets, it's important to look at a potential outcome of a average or a range or some kind of numerical value that can help ensure you have a foundation for a data point to drive further analytics. The three most commonly ones used are those mean, median, and mode. I will also discuss a percentile, a measure of a relative position. The first data measurement we're going to take a look at is the measures of location and the mean. The arithmetic mean is the primary measure of central location. It's often referred to as the average. The average is a simple calculation that's adding up all the observations and dividing by the total number of observations. The only thing that differs between a potential mean and a sample mean is the notation. A population mean is denoted as in this backwards looking U symbol or a mu. N observations in the population are X1, X2, and the overall number of observation points or data points and at times numerical values in a data set. U or the mu is a parameter. The sample mean is denoted as an X with a dash over it. So in this stake, this in this stake, the X with a dash over it is a statistic. Overall though, you're still trying to find the average in a data set. Now, the mean can give a misleading description of the center in the presence of an extremely small or large observations or outliers. So in a large data set with a long list of numerical values, it can get lost in translation of, is the mean or the average, trying to find an average in an analysis, the right focus of the measurement. The median is another measure of central location not affected by outliers. Now, outliers we'll talk to in a little bit, but outliers are variations of data points or variables that do not necessarily fit into the schema of a mean, median, or mode. A median is the middle value of a data set. There's an equal number of observations that lie above and below the median. Generally, you must arrange the data in ascending order or low to high. The middle value, if the number of observations is odd, is your median. Now, the average of the two middle values is the number of the observations if it's even. If the mean and median are different, it is likely the variable contains outliers. So often, if you calculate all of your variables and add them together to get your mean or average, and you get one answer, then if you actually take the median, which is the way of putting the numbers in order, low to high, and if that middle value in the number set is, is odd, then you must compare your mean and median together. And if they're not the same, then there are outliers in the data. Because generally, outliers will skew information and skew the various measurements of mean or median. If you compare both of those calculations and you end up with vastly different numbers, then there definitely should be some type of outlier skewing that information. The next measurement of location is called the mode. The mode of a variable is the observation that occurs most frequently. There can be more than one or no modes. One mode is unimode, two modes is bimodal, two, two or more modes is multimodal. The model is less useful when there are more than three modes. The mode is a useful summary of a categorical variable. Remember, a categorical variable is good to have if you're looking for the most often occurrence. So for example, on average, the average age is 35 years old for someone who signs up to take an MBA program or the most, the most used number in a particular 
lottery system is a, this particular number. That's the mode, the most often used of some type of numerical data set. Now, let's take a look at the measurement of median and a bit more. The median is the middle observation. Half the observations, again, fall below or above the median. The median is also called the 50th percentile. A percentile is technically a measure of location. However, it is also used as a measure of relative position. The PTH percentile divides a variable into two parts. When you look at a data set, it's approximately P percent of the observations are less than the PTH percentile. So to calculate this, it's approximately 100 minus P percent of the pop observations are greater than the PTH percentile. So what you're doing is you're taking the overall above and below approach. What numbers are above the 50th percent and what numbers are below? And you take an overall measurement to say, this is our 50th percentile. Everything that falls above it is this. Everything that falls below it is that. Here's a straightforward snapshot and example of looking at business quarters, quarter one, quarter two, and quarter three, and seeing the overall result set taking place in each of those different quarters. So what you would do is take a look at either the variable of growth or value, as each stand for different things. The value, let's say, of profitability and the growth in sales. Let's say we wanted to know what is the 50th percentile between each of the quarters. So you'd actually take the overall scope of the min and max and find that middle number, 50th percent, to see which quarters are above that or below that. We want to benchmark ourselves at times in analytics to find out where are we above or below a certain median. It makes sense, especially if you're looking at different things such as time-based strategies, volume of, let's say, inventory or products, or in general, just trying to find, you know, a certain variance between the above 50 percent or likelihood or below 50 percent likelihood of something happening in predictive analytics. It's very important to understand that this is a very useful measurement in our analytics. Now, let's take a look at an example of a data set when it comes to the importance of understanding means and averages. For this, compute the corresponding average spending for each of the product categories by male and female customers. Let's say, for example, we are working in a retail environment and we want to know the average numbers spent or dollars spent from a customer on each of these categories. We take clothing as an example. I'm the clothing buyer or category manager of the retail store, and I want to take the data set. Let's say there's 130 total records, and we need to look at adding up all of the female total dollar amounts that have been spent. Like, for example, customer number one is just one record of one female who spent $246 on clothing. And then the second record is one unique customer or a male customer spending 171. I would separate the females from the males and then add up the totals of each of the different genders and they can do an average of both and they compare and contrast who spends more in clothing on an average sale you can do the same for health and tech or miscellaneous other categories this is important to know though so we know what maybe for example what marketing strategy we can target let's say for example in clothing it is females buying more and spending more each time they order or buy something in that category we may decide to send them a marketing element or campaign to influence them to buy more clothing to increase sales and profitability. Or we may try to find a tactic in marketing to target an advertisement to males to increase the amount that they're spending to try to increase their purchases. So this is just an example of the importance of understanding averages in a data set. Next, Let's take a look at the types of measurements of dispersion, shape, and association. Measures of central location reflect the typical or central value, but they fail to describe other characteristics. So here, what we're saying is that when you measure things such as mean, median, or mode, which are central locations, they give you a very straightforward data point, an outcome, a result, on an average, a most often occurrence of a variable with a mode, or the overall scope of a median at the 50th percentile. But they don't provide additional insight at times. So it's a starting place, but now we need to take a look at variations of dispersion, shape, and association to reveal more into the data sets and analytics. 
Measures of dispersion gauge the underlying variability of the variable. And that even though it's an average, what else can we derive from that average in a mean? Or if it's in mode, why does it populate the most out of the data set itself? It answers more of the questions beyond just the mean, median, or mode. Measures of shape reveal whether the distribution of the variable is symmetric or if the tails are more or less extreme than the normal distribution. Think of normal distribution as the overall understanding that it's a very focused data set that works for more often than not. Measures of association show whether two numeric variables have a linear relationship, meaning there's a correlation or some type of scope that these data variables do correlate. Measures of dispersion are numerical values. Zero indicates all the observations are identical. This increases as the observations become more diverse. So when you find a zero in that data set from a dispersion numerical value, they are identical. The range is the simplest measure. A range is the difference between the maximum and minimum. It's not good because it focuses solely on extreme observations. A range can be very low and very high and not give a very finite view and focused range to give you an outcome. The interquartile range, or IQR, is the difference between the third quartile and the first quartile. What you're really trying to do is get down to a level of a range that is tangible to use in analytics. So the IQR, or the interquartile range, is the Q3 minus Q1, which is the third quartile minus the first quartile. The range of the 50, middle 50% 50 of the variable and does not depend on extreme observations. This is one way to take a large range and break it down into sections and subtract the third quarter minus, minus the first quarter to get to that ideal range you're looking for. The next important element after we get comfortable understanding the various measurements of mean, median, and mode, and also how to look for var variability in those variables based on the other methods discussed, we also need to understand that in any data set and analytics for conducting our analytics, there could be outliers. How do you detect them? Well, extremely large or small observations for a variable are referred to as outliers. For example, let's say you had a great range between 1 and 10. Very simple, right? Where a lot of your numerical values on a bunch of on a data set had, you know, the results of 1 through 10 and all the numbers in between. But then you had a couple of numbers such as 37 or 48. Those would definitely be considered outliers because they don't really fall in the majority of a range to 1 and 10 or have an average within 1 and 10 etc. And then those numbers 37 and 48 could definitely skew an average. So that said, outliers are very much in, influenced though to say they can affect your overall average or standard deviation. Now standard deviation, what that means is an overall deviation from the overall data set. There's always a likelihood of a plus or minus 5% that there's a deviation from the actual result set. And that's okay. Sometimes in analytics, we're not always seeing 100% finite results when we're conducting various methods in analytics to find relationships or cause and effect in the data. That's why when we look for correlations or relationships, you see a standard deviation to give you some type of plus or minus 5%. Outliers can unduly influence summary statistics, such as the averages. In a small sample, the impact of outliers is particularly, particularly pronounced. Sometimes outliers may just be due to random variations, in which the case the relevant observations should remain in the data set. Alternatively, outliers may indicate bad data due to incorrectly recorded observations or incorrectly included observations in the data set. What this means is at times the data should not be there in the first place, and at times you make the judgment call to actually delete it out or not. Perhaps it's not working correctly for your data set and the analytics you're trying to conduct. In such cases, the relevant observations should be corrected or simply deleted from the data set. There are no universally agreed upon methods for treating outliers. It is important to be able to identify potential outliers in the data so that one can take corrective action so it doesn't really skew your results set. We first construct a box plot, which is an effective tool for identifying outliers. A series of box plots are also useful when comparing similar information for a variable gathered at another place or time. For example, let's say you were doing something based off 
the year of 2022 and conducting an analysis on that year. One outlier could be the fourth quarter of 2021 and therefore wasn't necessarily needed during this time frame. It could be right data, but just not the right time frame to analyze, but was in your data set. So if you were just trying to find out 2022 information, you would take out 2021. Another method of detecting outliers is also called a z-score, which we'll talk about here shortly. So this is an example of how to find outliers in the data. A common way to quickly summarize a variable is to use a five number summary. A five number summary shows the minimum, the quartiles, Q1, Q2, and Q3, and the maximum. A box plot, also referred to as a box and whisker plot, is a way to graphically display a five number summary. Generally, you draw a box encompassing the first and third quartiles. You draw a dashed vertical line in the box at the median. Then you calculate the IQR. Remember, that's the Q3 minus Q1 quarter. Draw a whisker that extends from the Q1 to the minimum value and not further than 1.5 times the IQR from Q1. Similarly, draw a line that extends from Q3 to the maximum value that is not farther, 1.5 times IQR from Q3. Use an asterisk or another symbol to indicate observations that are farther from that's 1.5 times quarter quarter R from the box. These observations are considered outliers. So in essence, what this means is look at the image. You have the over on the left side, the min and the very far right, the outlier. The outlier will fall outside of the calculation of Q3 minus Q1, especially if the median is between Q3 and Q1. Then you take that 1.5 outlier or outside range, and if it's outside of that, your outlier but doesn't fall within that spectrum of that number, then you have your outlier. Another key concept when it comes to detecting outliers is that you must look for the empirical rule. The empirical rule makes precise statements regarding the percentage of observations that fall within a specified number of standard deviations from the mean or the average. Assume the observations are drawn from a relatively symmetric and bell-shaped distribution, perhaps an inspection of its histogram. Approximately 68% of all observations fall into the interval X plus S plus or minus S, right here. The very bottom here, you can see about 68% falling within that range. 95% of observations fall into the interval X plus 2S. Approximately 100% of observations fall into X plus 3S, which means that we're looking for that likelihood that something falls within the overall range we're looking for. Now, what depends though is your data set and how focused it is. And that's why if outliers exist, you may skew your data to the overall 68% of the intervals where you wanna get more of a wider spectrum at times and gather the right data for your potential data set. The next method to detect an outlier is called a Z-score. It is often instructed to use the mean or average and the standard deviation to find the relative location of an observation. We use the z-score to find the relative position of an observation by, by dividing the difference of the observation from the mean or average by the standard deviation. This is what the formula looks like for a z-score. A z-score is a uni unitless measure. It measures the distance of an observation from the mean in terms of standard deviations. Converting observations into z-scores is also called standardizing the observations. Finally, what this means is after you've done any of the methods to overall ensure that you've identified your outliers and to get your data set ready to go with any of the measurements we've talked about, it's all about standardization. Standardization is a common technique used in data analytics when dealing with variables measure, measured using different scales. If the distribution of a variable is relatively symmetric and bell-shaped, we can also use z-scores to, to detect outliers. Since almost all observations fall within three standard deviations of the mean, it is common to treat an observation as an outlier if the z-score is more than three or less than three. It must be between that of more than three or less than three to truly be a qualified z-score. Such observations must be reviewed to determine whether they should remain in the data set. So, in summary, figuring out the right measurement is important, whether it's a mean, median, or mode, and to go a step further, looking for correlations and to make sure that your standard deviation is intact, and to identify outliers that should either be 
we looked at as usefulness in your data set or not used at all. This concludes the overview of chapter three in brief. Thank you so much for your time and we'll see you again in chapter four.